Welcome to tomorrow. I am Carrie Ann and I will be your Capcom. The rest of the crew today is a Jared, a Mike, and an Athena. So, Jared, what do you have first for us? Well, something on Mars is making it a bit gassy. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, Mike? Northrop Grumman officially has acquired Orbital ATK. I cannot wait to hear what that new acronym is. And then Athena on the observation <laughs> deck has got an interview. Yes, I'll be interviewing Isaac Arthur from his channel, Science and Futurism, and we'll be discussing the future of humanity and technology. Oh, that sounds awesome. And then at the end, we're going to come back together and talk about your questions and comments about last week's show. This is Tomorrow Orbit 11.23. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Now, before we jump right into launches and news, I want to make sure that we give a huge thank you to the Escape Velocity citizens. These are the people who have contributed $10 per episode. They, of course, get their name in all three segments of the show. They get free worldwide shipping in the Tomorrow Swag Store, voting rights and upcoming roundtable discussions, and honestly, so very much more. Oh, they also get access to our Escape Velocity Discord channel, where no new show ideas are born, as it were. If you are interested in becoming a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to Patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Okie dokie. So Ooh. we've got some launches, and this is exciting because we always like launches. Launches, launches, <laughs> launches, launches. Sometimes I feel like the little green aliens from a, a Toy Story of like, launches. Um, okay. Uh. <laughs> right? <laughs> da -da. Uh, <laughs> sorry, don't mind me. Uh, so, Mr. Mike, <laughs> what was the first launch that we had in this last week? Well, over this past week, the first one that happened was a really powerful communications satellite was launched by SpaceX uh, on their Falcon 9 rocket for SES. And uh, with that rocket, it was actually a previously foam booster that was previously used on the X-37B space plane, which launched uh, last uh, September uh, last year. Hmm. So let's check out the launch of the uh, SES-12 communications six, satellite. Five, four, three, two, one. Zero ignition. Lift off. This launch occurred on Monday, June 4th at 4.45 coordinated universal time. This launch occurred on Monday, June 4th at 4.45 Coordinated Universal Time from Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. And as I said, uh, SpaceX had previously flown the booster for the X-37 space plane, and they actually delayed this launch from May 31st to conduct additional checks on the launcher. The payload was specifically the SCS-12 satellite and was assembled by Airbus Defense in Space in Toulouse, France. And the SCS-12 satellite carries plasma thrusters that are mounted on uh, robotic arms for nearly all of its in-orbit maneuvers, eliminated the need for large, large uh, liquid propellant takes. And uh, the satellite weighs only 5,383 kilograms um, with its supply of xenon propellant, um, which is a, a, a satellite with a similar capability would weigh upwards of 10 metric tons. So they were able to uh, have a, 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 a medium-class rocket launch this instead. However, the uh, Falcon 9 dropped its previously flown first stage in the Atlantic nearly three minutes after cutoff and did not intend to retrieve the first stage. Um, it uh, was based on the, uh, the earlier Block 4 version, and apparently there was also no attempt to recover the payload fairing on this flight as well. The second stage engine, though, switched off nearly eight and a half minutes into flight. You saw its relight there just a moment ago, and then uh, successfully uh, delivered the SES-12 satellite in 26 minutes into flight as it was uh, sailing over Africa, and was placed into a geostationary transfer orbit about 58,000 kilometers or 36,000 miles above Earth and tilted about 26 degrees to the equator. And with that, it's uh, one of the most powerful satellites that uh, SES has in their fleet now. And uh, with all the cost savings with uh, using the plasma thrusters, even though it'll take more time to get it into its eventual geostationary orbit, it, the savings for it is going to allow the mission to last 
possibly upwards of 20 years as wow. opposed to like a, a five to 10 year mission. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. very wow. exciting for that mission. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's crazy. Uh, it's I was sorry. I was distracted by the chat room because uh, Destructor 1701 says Brian Malstead time lapse there. Uh, known by some <laughs> as the most beautiful man that SpaceX employs. So it was very distracting. I apologize for that. Um, OK, so there were other launches, though. Uh, there was a Long March launch. Is that correct? Yes, there was. And uh, with this Long March launch, it was actually the uh, last in a uh, um, an older generation of spin-stabilized uh, weather satellites that China has launched, uh, the Feng Yun series, mm. specifically the Feng Yun 2 series of spacecraft. Um, and it's going to be checking out a lot of uh, tropical weather and stuff over the uh, Africa and over Asia um, to help complete their weather uh, meteorological system. This launch of the Long March 3A occurred on Tuesday, June 5th at 1307 Coordinated Universal Time from the Zhicheng Space Center in uh, southwestern China's Zhishuan province. And the Feng Yun 2H satellite is the eighth and final satellite in that Feng Yun 2 series, which have been launching since 1997 and have really similar missions to, Na uh, to NOAA's GOES satellites. Uh, the U.S. military tracking data indicated that the, uh, the booster and the satellite were placed into an elliptical transfer orbit ranging between 144 miles or 233 kilometers and 35,800 kilometers. So this is another one of those geostationary transfer orbits. Um, and this was actually the 17th uh, uh, launch for China. And I forgot to mention that uh, the SpaceX launch that we just saw was America's 17th launch and the 11th launch for SpaceX so far this year. So uh, United States and China are next and neck at 17 launches a piece. Oh, my goodness. There we go. That's so crazy. Oh, that's so exciting. All right. And, I mean, not to be outdone, uh, Russia, of course, got in in the game. It's <laughs> like, I know it's not an actual space race of how many launches per year, but um, when we start keeping track like that, it starts to feel like it really, really quickly. So uh, what's happened yeah. with the Soyuz launch? Now, before we get started on this Soyuz yeah. launch, uh, there we have to talk about something. You guys may know about the rocket frog, or maybe even the rocket spider, but uh, <laughs> allow me to introduce the rocket bird. This was from the Ros Ros Cosmos live feed. No way! <laughs> <gasps> Just checking things out. Oh, I hey, love up? it. Oh, see, we okay, need to get that. Later. We need to get that uh, <laughs> from Rocket Lab with all of those birds. Remember the wait? Wasn't there? Yes. A, what, right? They had like all those birds yeah, in the background. Yeah, they had tons of seagulls and stuff all <laughs> over the background. Yeah, if one could get up close to the camera like that, that would be great. That is absolutely uh, but in all amazing. Serious, though, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> in all seriousness, no, we need to talk about the uh, the crew rotation that happened over this past week really quickly. Well, first, we we'll want to start with the crew that came home. Mm -hmm. uh, a Russian cosmonaut, a NASA flight engineer, and a Japanese physician astronaut went into their Soyuz MS.07 spacecraft and uh, departed after a 168-day mission. And they included Commander Anton Shkeplerov, Scott Tingle, and Norishige Kanai. And their uh, spacecraft separated from the RASVET module on Sunday. Day, June 3rd, and then re-entered the atmosphere and landed in Kazakhstan about three hours later at 4.17 Coordinated Universal Time, also on Sunday. But still on board the station are Expedition 56 Commander Drew Feistel, Flight Engineer Ricky Arnold, and Russian cosmonaut Oleg Artemyev, Commander of the Soyuz MS-08 uh, spacecraft, which carried them into space last March, or rather on, on, on March 21st, uh, uh, just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. Now, as Expedition Expedition 56 officially begins. There's the guys that are up at the space station right now. Uh, the new MS-09 spacecraft is going to be sending the three new crew members uh, which joined them this week. For the new crew, they had two first-time flyers and one return flyer. And uh, the newbies include Serena Onion chancellor a NASA astronaut and flight surgeon on her first space flight, after being selected as an astronaut in 2009, as well as Commander Sergei Propo excuse me, Prokopiev making his first flight after being selected as a cosmonaut in 2010, and uh, German uh, Alexander Gerst, a European Space Agency astronaut who was selected in 2009. So uh, let's check out the launch.
Wow, wow, wow. Dude, so this those camera reviews. Wait, 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 wait. Hold no, really. Those camera reviews were so amazing. Oh, Holy my gosh. Check that out. Oh, oh, I mean, that one nice. looking I got to say, the La Rose Coast Coast live stream provided much better views and way higher quality. No offense, NASA, but you got to tune into the <laughs> Rose Coast Coast live stream anytime wow. there's a silly one. For Unreal. real, for real. All right, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, but in any case, uh, this launch of the Soyuz FG rocket occurred on Wednesday, June 6th at 312 coordinated universal time from Yuri Gagarin's launch pad at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. And something unique we got to see was these external camera views for the first time mounted mm -hmm. outside the uh, Soyuz spacecraft. Oh my goodness, some of these images, like we saw the payload fairing drop away, mm -hmm. and we at least got to see part of the second stage separation. Um, we can see the uh, the separation occurring right there, and all we really get to see from the external camera, which you'll see in a second here, is uh, the panels that drop away from the third stage, which you see in the animation right uh, there. That's okay. And then oh, in wow. real life, right there. Nice. Yeah, nice. Ah. I also like their However, uh, little uh, animated timeline, that's funny, go on. Yeah, no, their animation is way better than the NASA timeline as well. So, yeah, there's that. <laughs> but the big highlight of the external camera view, though, was being able to see the third stage separation. Oh, my gosh. Not only did we get to see the gases and the plume of the rocket exhaust, but we got to see the entire block I upper stage fall away from view for the first time. Look at that. Gosh, that's wow. beautiful. That's a great shot. Wow. Wow. Yeah. First time we've ever seen a block eye in real life uh, uh, separate from the Soyuz spacecraft. Whew. And we even got to see the, uh, uh, the solar panels deploy uh, in this little uh, uh, clip nice. right there, too. Wow. But in any case, uh, two days after launching uh, from Kazakhstan, the Soyuz MS-09 spacecraft uh, had a, a nice uh, rendezvous and wrapped that up on Friday, docking at the International Space Station's Earth-facing Rosvet port, less than a week after the other three crew members departed from that same port. And the docking between the two spacecraft occurred on Friday, June 8th at 5.01 Coordinated Universal Time, and 90 minutes later, the hatch was opened between the Soyuz and the ISS. And and I must say that I am so happy that all the HD cameras are working properly to capture all of those multiple angles of the docking as it occurs. And that, too, is just, yeah, just beautiful. Gorgeous. Just beautiful. Uh, yeah. Nice timing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Anyway, the, uh, the Soyuz MS-08 crew is scheduled to return to Earth on October 4th, while the MS-09 uh, crew plan to remain until December 13th. And I love that shot right there, just how quickly uh, the sun goes down uh, uh, when, they, when they get to that part in their orbit. But beautiful footage, beautiful footage. And since we're keeping track, this is the eighth launch for Russia so far this year. Nice. Nice. They still have time. Whew. You know, China's got 11, yeah. America's got 11, Russia's only got eight, but they still have time. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. All right. Mr. Jaren. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, by the way. Yeah. Great stuff. Mr. Oh, Jaren. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't just call this Mars farts. Well, it's kind of different from farts. <laughs> so. All right. Um, Give it to me. Compositionally, <laughs> it's different from farts. <laughs> All right. That's it fair. It has that's the fair. thing that farts have in them, uh -huh. but farts have a different amount of this in it. All so right. like there's lots of nitrogen, there's a little bit of methane and and it, okay. Um, so it's always nice to get a good confirmation of something that like you've confirmed ahead of time, especially when your new confirmation is like, yeah, it's even better than you thought it was, right? <laughs> so we've known that Mars has organics mm -hmm. and complex organics on the, the surface. And Curiosity has been cruising around the surface of Mars for almost six years now, and it's covered a lot of ground. And one of those places uh, was in that image right there called the Pahrump Hills, and it sampled two sites from a dry lake bed in that area. Now, the Pahrump Hills were an excellent place to take samples because it had a very high percentage of rocks that are called mudstone, which mudstone is noted for its ability to preserve chemical records of, uh, you know, like a chemical record of their formation. Mm -hmm. uh, now the samples, they were taken into this instrument right here, uh, uh, which is called the Sample Analysis at Mars instrument. And mm -hmm. it's inside of Curiosity's body. And it can, it can chemically analyze samples in exquisite detail. And they found schnapps, which is is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Not Those are the, peach or mint or No, I mean, that's good. Um, you okay. know, as, as we say up at Griffith, all life must be loaded with schnapps at all times. Uh -huh. um, because those <laughs> are the six most, those are the six elements that all life on Earth that we've studied shares. Gotcha. So Give it to me again. Schnapps? The, schna schnapps. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Perfect. So, there you go. 
It also found other organic compounds like benzene and propane in there as well. Interesting. Right? Interesting oh. stuff. Now, we need to remember that organics, uh, in this case, means a molecule containing carbon, uh, which, although it can be generated by biological sources like life, mm -hmm. um, they can even more easily be generated by geological sources as well. Mm -hmm. So there was kind of some tempering of expectations of, is it aliens? Well, no, right. not really. Gotcha. Um, it's just saying that, yeah, there's some more complex uh, organic molecules on Mars' surface, and there's actually more of them than we expected. They're about about two orders of magnitude more than oh. was initially expected. Well, that's cool. Now, also announced, which is where we get into the gassy Mars bit, mm -hmm. is that there is a true seasonal detection of atmospheric methane from Curiosity. So, this is something that's been observed by several spacecraft in orbit around mm -hmm. Mars. They've seen that sometimes, you know, you'll get more methane at a certain time of a Martian year, and then it'll dip out, and then more will come back, and mm -hmm. it'll dip out. But this hadn't really been conclusively proven at the surface of Mars. Okay. But now they have. And this is really exciting because methane is broken down by exposure to ultraviolet light very quickly. Mm -hmm. So that means that there has to be something supplying the methane in Mars's atmosphere. Right. Because there's no magnetic field and a very thin atmosphere. It just floats so away. So the radiation goes right in and it breaks down the methane almost immediately. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So, Methane can come from the byproducts of biological sources. Mm -hmm. I mean, humans generate methane, mm -hmm. some more than others. Um, but there's also geological sources. Looking at you, Jared, by the way. Go on. I was going to say. Uh, but there's also <laughs> geological sources that can generate <laughs> methane. Um, like, you can, you can actually get water and the mineral olivine to interact with each other and generate methane from olivine. that. Olivine. Yes, olivine. So. Not like olives. No, uh, it is green okay, in appearance, cool. but it's uh, it's like a magnesium silicate kind of thing. It's okay. really cool. I have like a big chunk of it on my desk at home because it's it's beautiful, beautiful green. But you can literally toss water on it and it will generate methane. So you can make methane from geological sources. So this is not a confirmation of either biological or geological sources. Right. It just is, yeah, that's not like, we're confirming what the satellites in orbit around Mars are seeing, but okay. we're confirming it from the ground for the first time. Nice. So really exciting stuff that was announced this week. So yeah. good stuff. So. I, I, I need to come over that and that is the me. reaction. Do you think that that is the reaction that's happening, that there's uh, uh, water that's causing this chemical reaction? Oh, well, olivine is all over the surface of Mars um, when, we, when we analyze it. Um, so if it, if it is olivine that's generating that, uh, that reaction, it's ha it has to be underneath the surface of Mars. And there, is there likely, th there should be enough pressure from the material above it to keep water as a, so as a liquid, um, which would allow it to react. But uh, nobody's making a conclusive draw on that uh, because we haven't, we, you know, we we're not able to drill deep enough to confirm mm -hmm. that. So um, also the InSight lander, which is going to land in November, which mm -hmm. is going to put a probe about 10 meters down into the surface of Mars, that's not deep enough to prove it either. So, um, so yeah, there's, this will be a little bit of a mystery One. unless we can specify a, what type of methane it is, uh, but that would likely require a more complex instrument than the sampling at Mars or SAM instrument. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll talk about that next week since I think our guest is going to talk about the Mars 2020 rover. So. Yeah. Yeah, be pretty cool. Mike, so, another one question? more question I do have um, is that is olivine those little blue pebbles that are seen on certain spots on Mars? Or um, I can, is that something? No, that's something else. I'm not exactly sure what that is, uh, but olivine's got a much more uh, sort of like a uh, greenish kind of color to it. It can even be a dark rock as well. So um, Athena in the chat room mm -hmm. uh, actually put a link if Mike, if you're able to, I was gonna, I literally, I keep forgetting that you're not actually here. I was going to show you my computer screen as if somehow that magically helps. Even we're fooled. Um, wow, goodness, it's one of those days. Oh, okay, right there. Okay. Yeah, 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 see, it's, it's fine. Uh, it looks almost like a natural sponge uh, kind of texture. I'm sure it's hard, but uh, yeah, kind of a, a definite. Actually, it's kind of like the green of, of Jared's shirt mm -hmm. today. Yeah, a little bit. It's kind, it's kind of this color. So, yeah. yeah. Which also matches your eyes. Yeah. All right. Well, that's interesting. awkward now. Um, but I did that to myself. So, yeah. uh, interesting. That's that's really cool. And and I like yeah, that. That's pretty that's neat. fun. So. All right, Mike. I, now, I tweeted about this earlier this week uh, because I need to know <laughs> from all of my Tomorrow peeps uh, what the new acronym was because I needed to know who was a sub-segment of somebody else. And um, Jeff Faust 
bless his heart, uh, took me a little too seriously and was like, no, Carrie, and it's like this. And I went, oh, that's not what I meant. We love you, but Jeff. thank you, Jeff. Yeah, we love you. So, you're such a good one. <laughs> oh, so I'm not oh, normally yeah. that dry is the thing. I think sarcasm. Yeah, the internet needs a sarcasm <laughs> fun, people. Um, all right, so we're talking about Northrop Grumman. We're talking about Orbital, Orbital ATK, or what is no longer called Orbital ATK. Fill everybody else yeah. in on what we're talking about. And we've joked quite a bit on the show <laughs> that uh, the merger is going to be called like Orbital ATK, a space division of Northrop Grumman. But that's not the the name or the acronym. That they <laughs> Which is a good to name. With. They should have taken it. But go on. <laughs> uh, apparently, they don't watch the show enough. So. Oh, well. uh, that's, that's too bad. That's too bad. But the uh, official acquisition was uh, concluded on Wednesday. And uh, with the absorption of all the, the launch vehicle development, satellite manufacturing, and munitions supplies that uh, Orbital ATK does, the new business unit of Northrop Grumman is going to be called Northrop Grumman Innovation Systems, or NGIS, which sounds like a weird like thing that organizes like crimes or something to launch pads. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, oh, I see what you did there. But, <laughs> Very good. The uh, the the nine point two billion dollar acquisition though uh, was executed with seven point eight billion dollars in cash and one point four billion dollars in debt transfer. And uh, the the whole uh, uh, closed the day after the Federal Trade Commission cleared the whole transaction. And of course, this was after all the different stakeholders, of course, approved it uh, themselves. Uh, there was a provision though that required Northrop Grumman to make the orbital ATK developed solid rocket motors available to other defense and aerospace contractors so they don't have like a, a generate a monopoly on solid rocket motors so to speak um, officials uh, expect no immediate changes to orbital ATK's major uh, space initiatives such as their cargo resupply program for the International Space Station their new rocket in development to compete with SpaceX and United Launch Alliance for the uh, US military launch contracts and its role as a builder of commuter, uh, commercial communication satellites and military spacecraft and Northrop is apparently very supportive of the EEL, uh, EELV class rocket, recently dubbed Omega, that is going to compete with those other medium to heavy class rockets for government payloads. But with this acquisition happening on the cusp of a Pegasus launch from a uh, L1011 Stargazer carrier jet, which just recently returned for maintenance on the payload, I wonder how quickly the old Orbital ATK logo will be replaced. And I mm. also yeah. hope that the NGIS... Hey. Is Cool looking somehow. I, I'm not sure how, but somehow. <laughs> uh, before it's purchased, though, of Orbital ATK. An idea. Whoops. We are developing solutions that prevent there, cyber threats from becoming cyber attacks. Sorry about that. But uh, before it's uh, purchase of Orbital ATK, um, we are discovering trends. Nice. So yeah, as you can see from some of the stuff in this video here, apologize for the audio, uh, Northrop Grumman is also a leading player, uh, not in the launch industry, but has a long history of producing spacecraft. And their facility in Redondo Beach, California is building the James Webb Space Telescope. And of course, they also build airplanes and airplane components and supply radars, avionics, and other components to the military. And uh, although Northrop tends to focus on the larger systems that have a set of uh, mission applications that is attended with the class of platforms, Platform, Orbital ATK is a lot more uh, versatile with their small and medium, more agile uh, size uh, spacecraft. So I think that this whole merger is going to be very good. And I think it's kind of a match made in heaven, so to speak. And uh, the things that we're going to be seeing from them, I think, are going to be really interesting. Yeah, totally. Uh, I'm with you on the logo thing, though, because I really kind of liked Orbital ATK's logo, uh, which is funny because uh, it's only been like, what, two, three years since uh, Orbital ATK even yeah. became a thing? Uh, to start, because yeah. it was orbital, was it orbital sciences? Orbital and, sciences, and yeah. ATK, right? And ATK. Yeah. Yep. Nice. See, I I retain some of this information sometimes. Um, <laughs> uh, interesting. We'll have to run out and buy all the T-shirts while we can, I guess, and then <laughs> and then we'll just always There'll have the logo definitely forever. Definitely be a sale on those. Yeah. Right. So, all right. Yeah. So, Mr. Jared, back to uh, back to other uh, planet things. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's right. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Because we're starting to, you know, get results from the, st the data that New Horizons has sent back. Because mm -hmm. it flew by Pluto in July of 2015, but it took 
16 months to get that data back. From all of the data back from Pluto. Pluto so, is far. Yes, it's what we're far. Trying to say. Um, also, the the comms package was small and yes. not particularly powerful um, in order to save money. Because um, as Alan Stern said, we have all the time in the world. You know, patience <laughs> um, with it there. So good, good move, uh, Doctor Stern. Um, and uh, it's just such a bizarre place. Um, and there's such, this was such a cool result that I just had to talk about it yeah. um, on here, which is that large terrestrial bodies that have an atmosphere, they should have dunes on Why? their surface. Why? Uh, because of the way the atmosphere is going to move. <laughs> because of the way it is. So, And I'll, I'll explain it a little bit more All right. uh, later with this. Like here on Earth, sand dunes, for sure. example. Like these are the, the uh, Kelso dunes in California. This is, I took this photo climbing them nice. up there, which was cool. Uh, we also see sand dunes on Mars as well. And they actually look a lot like the dunes that we see here on Earth. So, so cool. isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. But if you far flung out in the Kuiper Belt, lo and behold, Pluto has dunes as well. They're specifically in Sputnik Planitia, a large, the large plane that makes up the left lobe of the heart on Pluto. Hmm. Now, Pluto's atmosphere may be one ten thousandth as thick and be about one one hundredth the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere, but it contains fine particles of methane. And winds that form in its atmosphere grab those fine particles of methane from the bases of nearby mountains and lift them away. And those winds actually whip across the surface at about 35 kilometers an hour. So there's, hmm. there's some cooking winds out there. All right. The gravity pulls them back down eventually, uh, but they bounce when they impact the surface. And they bounce really, really far when they impact the surface as well, because Pluto has very low surface gravity. It's only about one twelfth the surface gravity that we have uh, here on Earth. So, uh, <laughs> goodness, that's, uh, that's pretty low. Yeah. Now those particles, they accumulate where they settle after bouncing, and that is how the dunes form on Pluto. Interesting. So, which is so cool. They're not made of sand. They're made right. of little particles of methane. Huh. So little methane ice particles. Aww. So like ice dunes. Ice dunes. So, Interesting. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, it is. So, so crazy. Yeah. yeah and yeah. I can't wait to I see. I guess it's just the way that they're falling as as they uh, get pulled back down that's uh, making them create those uh, the dunes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, and they and they make Very those structures because they'll literally bounce and they'll just keep you know they'll keep bouncing. Right. And they'll make you know just those those sets of dunes. <laughs> it's just so cool that they're able to do that. Yeah, so, that's fascinating. Very cool result and. Also, I can't wait to see what more is going to come out of the New Horizons data because it's it's now now all the studies are starting to come out right. from that data set. So, nice. and it's going to be really exciting the next year or two. So, awesome. Yeah. All right. I'm really excited for the flyby of Ultima as well. Yeah. That's yeah. Be cool. Coming up, I'm going to have a sweet party for that. So. Yay! <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, what we like to do now is go into a little bit of a calendar break and look at the launches that Mike is going to be talking about next week, and then <laughs> <laughs> when we come back. Athena has got an interview. Stay with us. There's more tomorrow coming up next. Welcome back. Now, before we head directly into our interview, I want to make sure we give a th another thank you to our Escape Velocity patrons. These, of course, are the people who have uh, contributed $10 or more per episode. And then we also want to acknowledge our Orbital citizens. These citizens contribute $5 or more per episode. And uh, they also get a whole lot of other fun things, including their name in the, in the second segment of the show, second and third segment of the show, early access to view-only copy of the show rundown, and uh, again, voting rights on upcoming roundtable discussions. If you are interested in any of these things and more, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Now, Athena is on our observation deck with Isaac Arthur. Hey guys, awesome. I am super, super excited to get into this interview with Isaac Arthur from YouTube channel Science and Futurism. So thank you so much for joining us. I know we've been talking about wanting to bring you on for quite some time now. Uh, so I'm, I'm really... 
Yeah. Oh, man, I'm super, super stoked to get into this. Um, I really want to start from like the very beginning of where your interest really started to get into the topics that you talk about um, on your channel. Where did that start? Well, I think I was raised on my mother's side. I'm a geek and on my father's side, I'm a nerd. So it pretty much started from youth, you know, grew up on Star Trek. So. Oh, that's that's so awesome. Um, so when you first started going into um, these topics, I was watching quite a few of your videos on your channel, and you really talk about like the evolution that the human race is really moving into and how technology is impacting us. So I've got a question about where you maybe see humanity going in the next 10 years with technology. You know, it's always so hard to predict what's going to happen with technology even 10 years down the road. We didn't have smartphones back then, and 10 years before that, most people didn't have a personal computer. But uh, I don't think things will be too much different in 10 years. They'll come to us fairly naturally. We tend to focus a lot more on stuff, you know, not 10 years, but three or four centuries, three or four millennia out. So there's still a lot of new material there. Right, yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you on that. Um, a lot of our technology we're starting today, uh, it takes a while for things to really start to evolutionize and develop into something huge. So um, what I wanted to ask you is why it was that you went into going into having a YouTube channel to really uh, try and impact people uh, and, and get them, was it for more for their interests? I know that you personally just love the subject, but why is it that you turned to YouTube for this? The channel actually started as a bit of an accident. I, I was just experimenting with a different way of doing a PowerPoint presentation, ironically. Uh, then <laughs> awesome. I did another video later on, and then uh, that didn't feel complete on the subject. People asked a lot of questions, so I did another video following up on that. Then I did another video following up on that, and three, four years later, I seem to be doing them weekly now. <laughs> Oh, that, that's so awesome. And did you always have these epic animations? Because like, they're really cool, and how do, where do those come from? Uh, we've had a lot of volunteers who've been helping out to make uh, graphics for us. Uh, early on, we scrounged them where we could, and I made a few. Uh, you could always tell the ones I did because they looked like they were the uh, height of 1980s BBC animations or CGI. Uh, <laughs> but we've got some really good artists who, uh, who are just part of the audience and volunteer the time, and I'm very grateful to them because they've made the show. You know, those visual aids for things are so important for helping to clarify ideas. Yeah, um, are there like certain um, movies out there that you really feel like help translate it, a lot of what's going on with science um, into people? And like you just said, is it really tr translates well for people having animations? There's I guess certain... 2001 is always going to be the, the film that, especially cinematically, that uh, really got people visualizing this stuff in a way that we could not have done before then. But yeah, there's been a lot of, I mean, a lot of movies that. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> there have been a lot of movies that have really helped to you know, help people see what's going to happen in the future, help them start thinking about it. And uh, I, I would say as a whole, that's kind of part of it is the art and the fiction that goes along with science helps people imagine new places to be that feeds back into the art community and the fiction community to help see it even more in the future. And so there is this kind of constant interchange between the uh, arts and sciences to help us kind of explore the future. Yeah, and a perfect example actually is just behind you. There's this beautiful artwork. Um, of, oh, the uh, NASA art, yeah. Yeah, that's really it's, cool. Is that where a lot of your inspiration comes from for your channel to explore a lot of these topics? In many cases, yeah. A lot of old science fiction shows, a lot of the, the old art from um, Gerard K. O'Neill's uh, High Frontiers book in the 70s with oh, yeah. uh, Don Davis's artwork, for instance, is. Uh, you know, just fires of the imagination. A picture is worth a thousand, excuse me, a picture is worth a thousand words in many cases. And uh, a lot of those old O'Neill cylinders and things like that really helps you to visualize stuff in a way that just reading about wouldn't be able to allow. Yeah, oh, that's, that's so cool. Oh, I watched one of your most recent videos, which was Post-Scarcity Civilizations, Reality and Simulations. So you spoke a little bit about the simulation hypothesis, which touches on one of the biggest questions in human history, which is, why are we here? So I wanted to know, like, really your personal opinion on the simulation uh, theory and, and whether or not you think that that's what reality is. Well, the simulation hypothesis or the simulation argument is always a tricky one because if they're doing things right at the simulation end, there's no way you could tell from on the inside that you were in a simulation. So we'd often say you know, the question isn't, are we living in a simulation, but does it actually matter if we are? Because, you know, whatever we experience as reality, that is the reality that we've known. It's the reality that is. 
whether or not it's simulated doesn't necessarily make too much of a difference. Yeah, I guess that's similar with what people say when you look in the mirror. Um, that's really how everybody else sees you. It's actually a reflection of your face rather than how you really um, see yourself. It's like it, it's it's a different angle of your face. So that's really interesting mm -hmm. that um, that you're saying that. So as far as um, speaking about the the simulation hypothesis, do you think that the future of AI is might be something similar? Do you think that AI by us creating artificial intelligence, they may one day have their own AI civilization in a sense that we are the creators, they're the simulation. What, what, do, you, what do you think about that? We said that one of the best ways to check an AI out in case you're worried about it going crazy on you and you know going all Skynet is, is you run it inside a simulation to begin with and see if it uh, kills all its programmers in that one. You know, If it decides to go homicidal, then you know you probably don't want to actually unpack that for use in the real world. But where AI is concerned, I mean, there, there was always this um, possibility that in the future people will upload their minds and tend to live in virtual reality much more um, directly uh, than we would with, say, goggles and glasses. And, you know, the same would apply for artificial intelligence. If you are already a digital construct, then a digital environment, which cannot be simulated a lot more uh, energy efficiently uh, and processor efficiently, is probably the way you tend to go. So I think you could easily see uh, entire artificial civilizations, be they human originally, uh, post-biological, or artificial intelligence, uh, just existing not in the real world so much as in a completely digital setup. Cool. Now, um, I want to kind of go to another world for, for a question. Uh, we got a question from Tarantula. Uh, he says, uh, do you think that chemical rockets will get us to a decent proportion of space colonization, mm. or will we be pretty uh, scarcely colonized until space nuclear propulsion is truly utilized? Well, the only options on the table aren't chemicals or, or fission. Um, obviously, what we'd love to have is a fusion-based system or laser propulsion or possibly some variation that actually functions of a abuse or ramjet, uh, but uh, even if it just lets us slow down. But I, I do not feel that chemical rockets in the long term can allow us to really do space travel the way we'd like to. Uh, they are getting a lot better. I think a lot of us thought they were tapped out and were proven wrong in the last decade or so. But there is a maximum limit, and while I think that for now, they are showing a lot of promise to get us to places we weren't thinking we could get to just on chemical rockets, we are eventually going to have to find a different means of propulsion, whether that's electric-powered ion drives, uh, solar laser pushing, or atomic rockets, uh, is hard to say yet. Possibly all of the above. Wow. Um, and if we end up implementing that technology, um, say if it were to happen in our lifetime, just hypothetical, would you go to another to another civilization, another planet and build a civilization? Strangely enough, no. Uh, I, I would love to help such programs get started. I would love to see people go off and, and hit new places. But I myself, I, I do not like to even travel on airplanes, so I'd probably stay right here on Earth. Oh, wow. Uh, but I, I'd be very excited to see other people get a chance to go and, and enjoy those. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, good thing we have GoPros these days and Skype and everything. We can bring you on the journey. We have so many volunteers who'd be so happy to go that I, I won't feel the least bit guilty about staying here on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. We have a, another question from the chat from To Wicked. Um, they say, uh, "Do you honestly believe that humankind will survive that long uh, for there to be um, civilizations?" I mean, you can never tell for sure. But when we look at most doomsday scenarios, most of them are actually survivable. Uh, they're going to hurt civilization bad, but there'd be a remnant that could be built. And while we don't want to take anything for granted, anytime one of these problems comes up, we want to try to confront it and find solutions for it to either stop it from happening or recover from it. I tend to be pretty optimistic about our chances. I don't see it as a one in 10 that will survive, but more like a one in 10 that we won't. And uh, mm -hmm. even when you include things like artificial intelligence, I feel pretty comfortable that we will still be around and kicking, you know, it, we might not be entirely human uh, a thousand years from now in the classic sense, but I think that we'll still be around. Huh. Very interesting. Um, and someone actually mentions in the chat from Factor, they say, I think 3D printers will be a huge tech in the future as smartphones are now. So what do you think about 3D printers? Do you have one? Have you ever used one? I have used one. I do not actually have one, but um, they are definitely valuable and they're going to be there's not going to be a manned space mission outside of the atmosphere you know, outside of low orbit that doesn't include one of these things in the future any mars mission any moon mission you have to assume a heavy amount of 3d printing just because 
it allows you to save on so many items you would have to carry around for redundancy and allows you to make things on spot. You know, we always have to tinker with our old space probes to try to get just a little bit more utility or lifespan out of them. When you're dealing with a bigger object that's got a 3D printer on board, you can send your upgrades there and get them printed, hopefully. And while I think people sometimes treat 3D printers, especially future 3D printers, as a bit of a magic wand, like a Star Trek replicator, I, I do feel that they hold a ton of potential. And, and they are going to be vitally important to pretty much every future space mission, that, especially any manned ones. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that also. It's, it's um, been such a helpful tool just alone in, in rocket parts and building uh, um, necessary tools. So um, now going into something a bit more, uh, well, the quantum, quantum mechanics. I really want to get into that uh, because I see the book behind you. And I'm curious of your thoughts on um, quantum teleportation and quantum entanglement with particles and then, you know, possibly the future of travel with that. You think it's possible. We always have a problem with uh, with quantum in terms of uh, was somebody was joking with the other day is if we stick quantum in front of it, it's like a magic wall that can do anything. Quantum computing, uh, which of course relies on quantum entanglement, is going to be invaluable, but it's not necessarily automatically a supercomputer. And the same thing for uh, quantum teleportation. In most versions where you're using quantum teleportation, you're not actually moving any objects, you're transferring the state, which is arguably semantic in some contexts. But quantum teleportation doesn't really allow us the options for fashion like communication or travel that people would like to see and that we often see in science fiction. On the other hand, it, it could easily end up having some very powerful applications that we just don't even fully see and realize yet. Obviously, if you want to be able to move data or move, uh, if you can move data, you can effectively move people if they're willing to be digitized um, around very quickly. But uh, you know, quantum is such a, a tricky topic to always discuss because there are so many aspects of it that are all very difficult to really visualize. And I think that's one of the problems that happens with both quantum computing and quantum teleportation is sometimes we let our science fiction run a little bit ahead of us there. Um, it is incredibly useful technology. You cannot underestimate the value of it, but the, sorry, overestimate the value of it. But at the same time, it's got a lot of work to be done before we see too many practical applications. Yeah, and um, speaking of uh, quantum theory, I'm curious if you've heard a little bit about pilot wave theory, um, as far as you know, like how with quantum, so with quantum mechanics, it d discusses how it's either a wave or a particle, or it's both a wave and a particle. And there's a new theory about it being um, a particle that rides a wave. So I was just curious if you heard anything about that recently and what your thoughts are on it. I have a very firm stance on anything quantum mechanical. I, I default to the Copenhagen interpretation, generally speaking, over multiverses. But until you can actually show a testable theory that uh, that can actually distinguish which one of these is correct, I tend to feel like a lot of times we're just kind of picking a theory to go with that fits it. And in the meantime, we don't really have a very clear understanding of what's going on. I don't think the wave particle duality thing, though, is really all that paradoxical in of itself. I mean, obviously, is a paradox in the classic sense, but we have a lot of things that have multiple attributes, and they are not necessarily um, paradoxical the way that that you can't have just one or the other. I, I think that where quantum is concerned, we have to look at it it's sort of more like the basic resolution of the universe. This is this is the minimum level you can go to. Um, you can also view that as going down like the Planck length, for instance, but. As with any of these theories, you know, somebody's going to get a Nobel Prize one day for having figured out which of these theories is correct. Same for things like string theory or brain and brain theory. And until they have a testable theory, though, one that they can actually get some evidence for, I tend to feel like it's a bad idea for us to, to invest ourselves too much into those. Okay. Um, and someone in the chat called Prismara asks about orbital rings. What are your thoughts on orbital <laughs> oh, rings? Personal favorite. Uh, what we were joking is if you love your planet, put a put a ring on it. Um, <laughs> orbital rings are the best of all. No, and this is this is surprisingly old tech. It seems like it's really high tech because you're suspending a ring over top of a planet. Uh, but at the same time, I think Paul Birch came with the idea in, in the early eighties or the late seventies, and it's a very simple one. You're running a you're running a copper wire or something else magnetic uh, around the Earth at higher than orbital speed. And you're floating above that something else, which is essentially stationary, and their combined momentum has the uh, has the appropriate orbital velocity for uh, orbital momentum for that height. Uh, but it's a very simple piece of technology, uh, and yet at the same time, it allows us to do things that would be almost impossible in any other space launch context. 
normally when we're dealing with uh, things like rockets, you can't launch a rocket anywhere near a city. Uh, you can't use things like Staltran, for instance. You require this very large infrastructure where you have to accelerate, you know, across thousands of kilometers to really get to speed. With an orbital ring, you're not getting up to speed because you're just going up. And you could go up on a tether that, uh, while it needs to be strong, doesn't need to be anywhere near as strong as a space elevator. And these allow us to have launch costs that are, you know, in the dollar per kilogram region, as opposed to a thousand dollars a kilogram or even a hundred dollars a kilogram, like some other uh, advanced launch systems. Uh, I generally consider them to probably be one of the best potential long-term technologies for us. And again, it's not that they're high tech; it's that you don't build one of these things unless you're at that stage where you want to ship megatons of cargo up to and down from space every single day. Until then, it's not much point to build one. Wow, very interesting. Um, I that's, that's like that just blows my mind to even think about right now. Um, and it's a really good question in the chat. It's gonna be on the Fermi paradox. Uh, it's from Saint Alex. They say, with your optimistic answer and the likelihood of human survival, do you therefore think that the answer to the Fermi paradox is what mm -hmm. is that we are the first technological sentiment species in the galaxy? I would go a little bit further and say that the, the way the evidence looks, and, and it is a problem with the Fermi paradox, is not that there are, there are no good solutions. There's just degrees of bad solutions. Yeah. But the one the evidence seems to best support isn't just that life or intelligent, we always say technological life is real, because we don't know how common life might actually be, and it just doesn't involve intelligence very often, is not just so rare that we're the first ones to evolve in this galaxy, but probably in this entire supercluster, if not further out just because when you start looking at Kardashev two or Kardashev three civilizations, and if you can make it past you know the next century or so of human technology, you'd expect that it's almost impossible to get rid of a civilization at that point. Um, some remnants are always going to be in position to survive. Uh, these are civilizations that can, if they wish to be heard, uh, do so galaxy-wide or further. And with the case of a Kardashev three civilization, a galaxy-spanning one, you'd be able to see one uh, even galaxies away. You can't hear the radio signals, perhaps, but you can see them that far away. And we don't see any evidence of that. Uh, we've scanned many galaxies looking for infrared waste heat, and we don't see it. So we have to conclude that there's nobody close enough uh, in terms of time and space for us to have seen them yet. Whether or not that's true is hard to say, but with most other solutions, you either have to assume that um, maybe life is common enough, technology is common enough, but it all dies off, which I don't I don't care for that answer personally. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, or maybe they have some reason to hide, or maybe they transfer other universes somehow. There are a lot of options left over, so we can't rule any out. But to me, the one that seems most compelling at this time is just that however common life is, or even intelligence is, technology just does not get developed very often. Mm. That's uh, so interesting, which is why I think it's obviously so important and amazing that uh, you're doing what you're doing. And there's so much out there about like informing people on, on technology and the future of humanity, because that's what will inspire the, the younger generations to say, hey, I got to be innovative and, and create some form of technology. Um, so for the future of humanities, um, and still speaking about Fermi Paradox, Citizen31929 asks, um, do you think we'll go with a Dyson sphere or spread out colonies? If you know the, the future of humanity was both. Um, both, I mean, obviously not a not an actual Dyson sphere, but a Dyson swarm, which is a, a massive collection of, of uh, artificial habitats, power collectors, etc. Uh, I tend to think that you would see a big, much like with cities, you say, are we going to go more urban or are we going to go more rural? You do both. You know, uh, are we going to colonize our own solar system or colonize other ones? You, you do both. I think that we will see an early stage of uh, Dyson Swarm construction around Earth, out in the asteroid belt, and to a less degree around the other planets, particularly the Jovian moons. Um, but you wouldn't expect, for instance, uh, Jupiter, which in many ways is like its own solar system, uh, to be part of a main Dyson Swarm. It's a little too far from the sun for that to be practical. And then, of course, a lot depends on what is actually being used for power. If you have something that's better than sunlight, as free as sunlight is, then you still want to do that central conglomeration to cut down on calm times and travel times, but you wouldn't be as focused on getting the energy from the sun at that point. Um, so I would say that you know the biggest thing about the future is to say it's not which way we're going to go. We're probably going to go all of those directions. You know, there are so many options on the table, and I expect that we will use each and every one of them. Oh, that's such a cool thing to think about. Uh, and speaking of possibly if, if humans were to 
get off of Earth and expand to other um, moons or, or planets. Um, uh, Sarge Enzyme asks in the chat, he says, um, oh, whoops, sorry. Um, okay, so <laughs> Sir Gamelot asks, um, which of the orbital structures, planned or fictional, do you think will be most feasible for the near future? So a thousand plus people, um, you know, in cities and space. Uh, in terms of which of the uh, megastructures will be most probable, or which of the launch systems, do you, do you say? Uh, some of the, the largest orbital uh, large structures, planned or, or fictional, would probably be the most feasible for the near future. I would really love to see an you know, O'Neill sonar get built, especially the big ones. Um, and uh, you know, popular thing I talk about probably too much on the channel. Um, it's a favorite of mine. But I think in the in the early stages, we, you know, obviously we're going to go much smaller. You keep things very tight and very very you know minimal, so you can keep redundancy in play and keep costs down. So I think maybe the Gateway spaceport we talked about uh, from the Gateway Foundation would be one of the first bigger ones we build that you could actually call a real habitat or at least a, a good solid temporary lodging. But I do think that we will eventually build you know, O'Neill cylinders and bonospheres and many these other devices. They, they take a lot of raw materials. They take a lot of construction, but there's plenty of raw materials out there once you're set up in space and if you have good automation. And so I tend to think we would see clouds of, of literally millions of these uh, giant city-sized objects floating around in, in Earth's uh, upper orbits. Wow. Um, and so there's a really good question about that is if we are going to be expanding like this, uh, Sarge Enzyme asks, will people consider or identify themselves as humans after a few generations on another planet or moon? Well, this is an interesting one we were talking about is um, I would fully expect that there'll be people three, four thousand years from now who had been genetically engineered to look like centaurs or have wings who would, who would be offended if you said they were not human. I would also expect you to have people who looked exactly like you and me who lived on Mars who would be angry if you called them a Terran. And uh, so I think it's going to range a lot, but we are going to have to challenge our definition of what exactly human means. Uh, that, you know, is it about the mind? Is it about the body? Is it about your DNA? And uh, those are difficult things to really classify because uh, there was a story by Isaac Asimov called The Bicentennial Man where a robot had, had so many bits of its place all replaced uh, with organic components, the exact opposite we normally see with a human getting cybernetic components. And in the end, the only thing that he didn't have was a, uh, was a human brain. He was still using the positronic one that uh, robots had. And uh, you know, I think in the future, we'll see the examples of that quite regularly, possibly AI, who very much struggle to see themselves as human. Uh, and I think you'll, of course, see the other way around, where people will place bits and pieces of themselves to be more robotic, but still view themselves as human. Hmm. Well, we've got a question from our very own Ben. Uh, he asks, when do we need to, oh, sorry, what do we need to do today to get to a future where humans are working and living in the solar system in mass? You know, if you asked me 10 years ago, even five years ago, I would probably have said just wait and see. But what's awesome is we always talk uh, for the last, for most of my life, honestly, it's been soon. If we just wait on the uh, on the space, you know, exploration, it's going to keep being a little bit better. And soon we'll go to Mars or soon we'll go to the moon. There will be a tipping point. There will be a snowball point. And I think we actually hit it a couple of years ago and we were about to really get there. So instead of Mars always being 20 years away, I think we might actually be there in another decade. And it doesn't feel like a mm. wild statement anymore or very upbeat and optimistic. I think that we have actually hit that tipping point and we are going to start seeing an awful lot more economic and uh, infrastructure developed in orbit, not just satellites for communications and science research, but satellites for power, uh, industry that's actually manufacturing stuff for Earth up there, but more importantly, for up in space. I think we might actually see asteroid mining and you know, in this next generation. One doesn't want to assume these things too much. Predictions about this tend to go a bit awry, but for me, I think that we actually are there now. I think we have hit that snowball point, uh, largely because of SpaceX and some others who have been doing some work on that. And that, uh, you know, all those things we all been patiently waiting and dreaming for, I feel like they are very close to the horizon now. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on, on that one also. Um, I mean, ugh, it's just, it's incredible how far we're, we're really coming and how uh, much of a common language it's really become for us to be on, on other planets outside of Earth. Um, so DMART asks, how aggressive do you think we should be to find other life in our solar system, weighing the risk of contaminating with Earth life? 
this is always tricky. As you say, if, if you find a nice plant that's very like Olaf, you don't colonize it, you quarantine it because you don't want to worry about cross-contamination. You don't have to worry too much about viruses so much as microbes and invasive species. Um, I don't expect us to find life in the solar system, but it's not too improbable that we might find life uh, alive or extinct on Mars or Titan or some other place, Europa, uh, maybe even in the clouds of Venus. Um, we don't know how life, how volatile life is. And the last thing we want to do is destroy that, uh, both for the, I'd say, the ethical reasons, but also because the sheer value some of those things might have. I mean, you think about an organism that's been living on a place like Mars for the last three billion years. Uh, we don't want to bring that home because it might be either very, very good at living here, too good, or it might be very bad. Uh, but it could have all sorts of applications we never even thought of in terms of potential biotechnology research, uh, agricultural industry across the board. So even without the ethical concerns, we'd be forced to risk contaminating in these places until we're pretty positive they're they are, uh, they are alive. Uh, they're not alive. But that's all the more reason to push forward with more robotic approaches to exploration. I'm a big fan of manned missions, but I tend to feel the robot phase comes first. And uh, in a lot of these cases, we need to be able to do more than just walk around the surface. We need to be able to you know, use ground penetrating radar. On a case like Europa, we have to be able to drill through 10 kilometers or more of ice to actually be able to get a peek down there and see what's going on. Yeah, definitely robotic missions is, is a huge help, um, especially before you, we even want to send humans somewhere. Um, and I mean, look at on Earth, we use robots with, you know, uh, human beings. Yes, to, it's to the combination of the two. Yeah, it Precisely. doesn't have to be one or the other. Exactly. Uh, we've got a really good question um, off of YouTube. It's from Astro Yeezy. I believe that's how you say the name. Um, he says, so your answer to the Drake equation. You know, I think the Drake equation suffers from the fact that we know uh, we got about six terms there, seven terms in there. And yeah. there's three or four of them that we know the answer to within an order of magnitude. And that order of magnitude is about one in 10. So we look at the other bits of that and we tend to assume that the others are going to be somewhere in that region too. But we don't know if the chance of life forming on a planet is one in a billion or one in 10 or one in one practically. We don't know what the odds of it pursuing a higher intelligence evolutionary path is. You know, I, I know a lot of people think that surely evolution will take you to, uh, to brains, but most biologists I know say, no, that's actually a pretty bizarre pathway to take. And then, you know, we've had file for a million years and it's only been about 10,000 since we applied it to something like pottery. Uh, you know, we did not use it for much of anything. So there was a good chance that even where you have intelligence and you need some basic technology that people just don't really go much of anywhere with it. The universe is still a pretty young place too. You know, life should be getting more common and intelligent life more common as time goes on. You get more planets with the right metallicity, right components, and they have longer and longer to evolve because, you know, very few of the original stars in this universe have had time to die off yet. Our sun is in the top 5% or so in terms of mass and for the same reason, the lowest in lifespan. And, you know, many stars are going to have had plants around them. Many K-type stars would have tens of billions of years for life to evolve on before they ran out and killed those, uh, killed those plants off. So life should be getting a lot more common as time goes by. And I, I just feel that Drake's equation, there's nothing wrong with the equation other than it tends to guide people into assuming that the answer has got to be much higher than we expect. And in fact, um, Andrew Sandberg just released a paper on that. I can't remember the title right now, but it just came out a day or two ago discussing those odds. Ah, oh, interesting. I'll have to look into that. Um, well, I, I just love, and I'm sure a lot of people can agree of watching right now, just love hearing um, so much of the knowledge that you've gained and uh, how much insight you. you have on a lot of this stuff. So there is a question um, from YouTube from Full Eve, and they ask, uh, could you ask Isaac Arthur if he plans to leverage his fame and his viewership to try and fund actual space research, research of some kind, or perhaps create a society of willing patrons mm -hmm. to start building things in space? It seems to me if all of his subscribers gave 10 bucks, uh, the channel could launch its own small satellite. I feel like crowdfunding would be a way to break out the government funding trap. And he's one of the best positioned people to form a coherent and informed voice for such a community. I think he's overestimating my leverage quite a lot there. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, I am a huge fan of crowd, uh, crowdsourcing for funding. Uh, Patreon, of course, for a lot of our channels is a big deal. But allows so many projects to go forward that realistically were not not viable before, uh, especially on the kind of timetable it's going to take to get Congress uh, to to fund you. Um, 
I would not want to personally be behind one program because I like to be able to kind of dabble in all sorts of different areas. And, you know, the nice thing about science communicating is you have a chance to, uh, as you know, you get to, to give a shout out to this project or that project. And if people like it, they can go ahead and get involved in it. Uh, they're not getting involved in it because you want them to. They're getting involved in it because it sounds cool to them. And of course, our job is to tell people why it's cool. Um, and I don't think I'd want to be tied up to just one specific project. There are so many amazing bits of research and development going on these days. And it's just so much fun to actually get to look and get yourself involved with each one of those. So I hope that a lot of people will use their positions uh, in this community to, to get behind various projects. But I wouldn't want to get behind just one. Yeah. I love it. Well, definitely, I think it's it's a great idea to explore a few different. Well, it's the funnest part of what we get to do is that we yeah. get to get, get to meet and talk to all these people who do these so many fun projects. Yeah, it's oh, it's such an incredible journey too, and like to to because you become part of their journey because you're learning about their journey, and then you're yeah, you're the storyteller of what they've done. So that's incredible. I I love it. Now we usually wrap up on three really p pretty cool questions. Um, there's no wrong answer to them. So it's strictly just whatever, you know, whatever your opinion is. So the first one is, uh, what is your favorite space mission, past, present, or future? You know, I am not quite old enough, thankfully, to remember the Apollo landings, but uh, I, I always have a certain fondness for the vintage space stuff. They own Mercury and Apollo missions and, you know, Gagea and other and Mass Cosmos. And uh, I would say that that's, that's the one that, that is, always gets me. Uh, of course, uh, Curiosity was a big one for me, too, because that was closer to my own, you know, teen years. Um, and, um, no, I would say probably the stuff in the 60s and the 70s, uh, early 70s, just because there was so much actual enthusiasm with the public then that's ebbed off a little bit and is now starting to come on back and i'm you know that's for me recapturing that spirit is always my favorite yeah it, it, that that like passion that there was during the space race was just oh it was it was so a cool. sense of wonder yeah you definitely uh, you know, can't a trade sense that. of wonder did, did everybody tuned in to see a rocket launch now quite a few people still do i've mm -hmm. never gotten bored of seeing a rocket launch yet but you know, it's uh, it was the Simpsons episode where they ask how the mission's doing so far, and the guy turns the control and he says, uh, "I don't know. All these computers are just for monitoring TV ratings." <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I, yeah, that's a that's a good episode. Oh man, I miss the Simpsons so much. I got to start watching it again. Um, okay, yeah. next question is human or robotic exploration of the cosmos. Oh, I think we already hit that one. Both. You use a Vanguard of robots um, to get it wherever you can because they're often cheaper and more effective at certain tasks. At the end, though, uh, you know, ex exploration is a big deal for me, but to me, space is not about exploring it. It's about actually getting out there and living there. And that's there's no point in doing that with robots. I don't want to colonize Alpha Centauri with robots. I want to colonize with people. And so you have to have those manned missions so that we know what we're doing. But they do not have to be the first ones you do. Hmm. Interesting. Good answer. Um, next question would be, where should we go next? What are our options? Um, I mean, the usual one is, should we go to the moon or Mars? Uh, but I would say that actually the asteroid belt is pretty attractive, too. Hmm. Um, to me, getting an orbital infrastructure in low orbit is probably our first priority. And from there to the moon, and then from there, the asteroid belt and Mars and actually Venus, too, which gets uh, overlooked a lot. Yeah. Oh, man, that would be so great to explore. Uh, explore I don't want to pick just one. No, no, do them all. <laughs> I know. Yes. I totally, I totally vote with you on that one. And I've got a bonus question. Why space? Why not? I, yes. You know, the Earth is beautiful, and there's so much of Earth we haven't explored yet. And people will sometimes say, well, we should focus on our problems here at home first. And I say, well, as a species, while we've got problems here, we can walk and chew bubblegum at the same time. And so much of what we learn out there is going to apply back here and vice versa. The universe is a huge place with untapped resources and wonders. How can you not want to go out there and see it? Yeah. Oh, that's such a good answer. Well, Isaac, thank you so much for joining us. This has been such an awesome conversation. And I hope all of you guys enjoyed also. So definitely uh, stay tuned. We're going to do a quick break. And uh, when, you, when we come back, we're going to look at your questions and comments from last week's show. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs> We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, Help us find our way. 
we see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know. Our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. Welcome back, and before we get directly into comments, I want to make sure we give another thank you to our Escape Velocity patrons. And we also want to acknowledge our orbital citizens, as well as our suborbital citizens. And these are the people who contribute $2.50 per episode or more, and every little bit helps. Of course, they get their name in the show, and uh, we wouldn't be able to continue making these really awesome shows. I, I like somebody else definitely wrote the script because I would never say that these are really awesome shows. I'd say these are amazing shows. In any case, if you are interested <laughs> Wonder in who wrote getting, it. I know, getting your name in the show or any of the above, uh, head on over to <laughs> patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. <laughs> I just, I'm, it's very Ron Burgundy that way. I apologize. I just... Go ahead and just... I'm Gary and Higgin. Yeah, it's kind of how it's... So. Yeah, I know it is. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right. So last week, we were talking about Orion Span, Aurora's commercial yeah. space station, uh, with Mr. Frank Bunger, who's our C who is their CEO, not our CEO. Uh, and that was uh, episode Orbit 11.22. So just to give you some context as to what we're talking about here, and uh, I believe all of these comments come off of YouTube, so I will just go ahead and say that at the top and then try not to say it in every single uh, question. So first comment comes from a SpaceX fan. Weird, I didn't think those existed. Uh, to, to think that a human on Mars can do more work than rovers has been doing for years in just one week. Um, yeah, so I mean, mm, that, I think are. that's kind of the 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 sort of argument, right? That's why we always ask, like, what do you think about robotic missions versus human missions? Because mm -hmm. it seems like there's a lot of people who are in, like, the either-or kind of camp. Um, I think we are all kind of on the same page as one Isaac Arthur. Uh, yeah. so, you know, <laughs> saying that it need, needs to be uh, a dual sort of situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because but there's so many things that like robots can do that humans can't, and yes. at the same time, there's so many things that humans have that 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 obviously robots don't. You know, I feel like there's, uh, there's some power there between being able to visually see something yeah. on the surface, hold the grains of sand or whatever mm -hmm. is really there, mm -hmm. depending on where we go, if it's Mars or somewhere else. Um, but yeah, and as opposed to with robots, where like you can have a little robotic hand holding things and you can see things through cameras, but exactly, there's that that intermixing constantly. So I think that yeah. That's a really interesting thing that they say that. It's, that's something that rovers have been doing for years in just one week. I don't know so. if that's a, an exact uh, fair comparison I mean, was per it a se. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would say that humans are very finicky. Yes. So they require air, water, food, <laughs> yeah. some sort of psychological <laughs> comfort and other things like that. Um, <laughs> and that makes humans very difficult. This uh, is true. To, yeah. uh, to send out. Uh, to places presently, right. hopefully very, very soon, that will not be as big an issue as it presently is. Right. Um, also, w especially one of the big problems is that humans are very dirty. Um, so <laughs> it, it's yep. pretty much viewed in the entire scientific community that whenever the first crude landing on Mars happens, when they do their first EVA, mm -hmm. that's it. There's mm -hmm. no more clean samples. 
on yeah. Mars. Sure, That's sure, it. sure, sure. It's over. Mm -hmm. sure. sure. So yeah. there is this sort of, uh, especially with the pressure coming on now mm -hmm. um, from other companies, there is sort of this uh, this need. Um, there's sort of feeling that we need to get as much as we can to the surface and and if not study the stuff directly on the surface, do like what Mars 2020 is going to do where mm -hmm. they're going to cache uh, samples inside of the rover mm -hmm. so that they are sterile from the outside because like we say, when humans arrive, that's it. We've, we mm -hmm. have essentially begun com and commenced the contamination of Mars <laughs> with what we bring our, ourselves. Contamination um, as we go! So and I <laughs> and I know that like so many people, um, so many people are saying that it's going to uh, contaminate just the general area. But yeah, that's where you're taking your samples from, right? Yeah. Right. You're going to do it with your humans there as well. You might be able yeah. to separate it from from that there. Sure. Um, but you're dropping off stuff on the surface, and that sort of that sort of defeats the purpose of keeping things clean. Interesting. So for sure, and Mike. For all of those reasons that you brought up is why I'm looking forward to the singularity. And instead of sending robots or humans, we can send cyborgs instead. <laughs> nice. Yes. Just make sure they're clean. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> they can be cleaned in a vacuum yes, chamber where humans can't. Of right. Course. So you know, it's, it's, it's can, but. one thing I do want to point out really quickly though, uh, a, a little bit more towards Athena's point, uh, you said that humans are very dirty. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we've also had problems where the Martian dust has kind of covered up the solar panels of some of our landers and rovers and whatnot, and there's been issues with oh that, my right? That's so, actually uh, happening right now. There's, right, a, so there's a dust storm on Mars. Wouldn't it be great if you could send a human out to go, well, I just clean it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously not that. But you know what I'm saying? Well, what's just great about like that? like windshield wipers for like the solar panels. Right? So, <laughs> so <laughs> Mars's atmosphere is thick enough to generate like, uh, 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 what do you call them? Uh, dust devils. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, the dust devils have hit opportunity your spirit and it's actually cleaned off the Wait, solar what panels. are these? Yeah. yeah. They're like huge yeah. dust devils on the surface of dust Mars. Devils. And I think like a, almost like a tornado. It's like a Tumble tornado. Weed? Oh, okay. Um, but like Tumble I remember weed. seeing that a couple of years ago and people thought it was some sort of conspiracy because they're like, all right, what the heck? Opportunity was dirty as as as, as can be a week right, ago right. and now it's clean. Like is this on a studio somewhere? Is someone coming <laughs> out and like everyone freaked out? Yeah. No, it's I dust love devils it. that are coming by. Who lets a janitor on set? That's funny. <laughs> right. So that's <laughs> That's hilarious. But yeah, so which opportunity will be probably desperately in need of a cleaning event sooner rather than later <laughs> right. now because of the present dust storm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, it, it is a thing. So, All right. which is it's a cool thing. So nice. Yeah. All right, good. I'm glad but we're I'm on not, the same page. I don't disagree with that comment at all. <laughs> I mean, even in the halls of JPL, there's people there that say, like, oh, yeah, well, I'm not, you know, th that joke is made often at JPL. Oh, I'm sure. So, I'm sure. Um, so it's not, it's not wrong. Right. So. <laughs> I love yeah. it. I love it. All right. Uh, next comment comes from Arturus P. Says, yes, modern commercial space stations. It's the second most important step after commercial launchers, more important than colonies in low G planets. In my humble opinion, I was wondering what that meant. Yeah, I am H O. Sometimes, uh, in my <laughs> honest opinion, as well, I, I, it seems to be a little slightly interchangeable. I as opposed like, to LOL, <laughs> never means lots of love. Lots just, of love? Just no, <laughs> never. <laughs> Never. I never. Mom and dads that get that correct. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Just want to be really clear. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, that's interesting uh, that commercial space stations being, quote unquote, the second most important step after commercial, commercial launchers. Um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we long have held the idea of wouldn't it be cool if you have a private company launched to a private space station and it's just all private or, you know, commercial space, as it were. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily the most important, but it, I mean, it is really kind of, it's a really cool idea. Yeah, and again, it's like, you know, we have the launching, but what about the once you get there thing? Like, we, we've talked about a few times, so mm -hmm. I think that's a really good good idea. Plus, you'll want, like, a nice space lounge if you're, like, you know, taking yes. off, you have a layover somewhere before going somewhere else. So I think it's very important to have commercial space stations. Then you'll have, like, you know, somewhere to actually... You know, even if it's just for like actual purposes, like recharging, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But then I think the whole fun aspect of it, of like, oh, imagine what it would look like, like blue carpets, and you yeah. know, like go inside <laughs> and get some like, oh, uh, you'll have funny. your coffee, and it'll be like surface uh, surface tension <laughs> balls, like little bubbles of, of coffee. But um, I love it. Yeah, I think I think it's I. But it is also really important um, because again, like yeah, it's moving towards having space colonies, and as we we're talking about space hotels. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are important. So. Yeah. Totally, totally. You know, it's it, and one more other like <laughs> kind of point on that, if you will, uh, if you'll you know forgive me for this. Uh, 
I think that uh, there sometimes is a misconception that uh, people have to be like scientists and engineers to be interested in space and to mm -hmm. have some sort of place in space. And I think the really interesting part, the really uh, what a commercial launcher to a commercial space station would really sort of add gravity to, haha, mm -hmm. see what I did there, um, <laughs> is the idea that not everybody is a scientist and not everybody is an engineer. And sometimes you just kind of want to go to space because you just want to go to space. Mm -hmm. And you wanted to see be pre. You want to see pretty things, and you want to float around, and you want to do the cool stuff or whatever, but you don't necessarily have to have the degree or you know, be interested in getting the degree. Um, really quickly, uh, one Astro underscore Zach on Twitter said, I'm a huge space nerd, okay, but I'm not a scientist or engineer or computer scientist or maker or anything. Where do I fit into space? And a very good friend of the show, of the Tomorrow Show, Mr. Tori Bruno, replied with saying, space is big enough for everyone. I like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. it is big and it keeps expanding. <laughs> so it's just like just like the human population keeps expanding. So <laughs> and increasing. Totally. Um, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, and there, there's so many things, there's so many places too that you uh, can really actually be going to space. And mm -hmm. there's so many companies out there that are doing incredible things um, to like space for humanity. And like, you know, and they're working on that. And even like, I'm sure like, you know, with uh, with Virgin Galactic and what they want to do too is like, you know, actually have it be tourism, space yes. tourism. And like, that's awesome, you know? And, and I think that obviously, like you said, space is big enough for everyone. And um, I think that we constantly need that reminder that space is here, it's with us. It's just like, sometimes we get really trapped on our planet and think small and instead of bigger, but that's, totally, that's totally. my opinion. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's so funny. I uh, love this, yeah. I really, yeah, I really, really like that. Um, I'm sorry, Mike, I feel like I cut you off earlier. Did, was there something else you needed to say? I have, I have nothing else to get. You guys have pretty much just voiced all of my opinions yep. already. I, I definitely agree. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, all right, now, I know, Athena, you have to go, so I'm trying to just figure out exactly which one I want to do next. Okay. Because make sure that you get out on time. Um, let's Thanks. see. Let's see. All right, uh, so I'm going to skip the next one. I'm going to go to Robert Miller. Again, a comment off of YouTube says, history suggests success in this venture to be unlikely. I think it'll join the Artemis project, Excalibur Almaz, the mm -hmm. Roton rocket, or Roton rocket, the Mars flyby, the Mars one, the DCX, all of those. You know, I'm sure there's an exhaustive list there. Um, I'm gonna open this up. What do you guys think about that? Like, uh, do you think that this commercial space station project, this one in particular, is going to be something that uh, is going to be a possible thing? Is it just going to be a footnote in history? I think that like all of the different startups that we have brought on the show, they all have that, uh, that, uh, that risk, I guess, of being a failure. I mean, space is very hard and all of these different projects are, you know, extremely ambitious. Mm -hmm. And I think that with a commercial space station idea, I mean, Bigelow Aerospace has been out there for a long time, although they have the benefit of having a wealthy uh, founder to be able to support the, uh, the business. But mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, it's too early to say, you know, whether or not this is unlikely to succeed or not, because I mean, you even in the interview, Eric Bunger was talking about how even he was surprised at the level of, of investments that they got in their Series A round. So, mm -hmm. I mean, people like this idea. And I think that in general, you know, a lot of people want to go to space, seeing all these commercial launchers. Great, they're launching communication satellites. When are they going to start launching people? When can I go and, and take a trip? There's mm -hmm. lots of people that want to do this, although quite a few less that could afford the, what is it, $9.6 million mm -hmm. price tag or right, yeah, uh, what, right. what he was quoting. But yeah. we can't say whether or not that it's going to fail or succeed yet because, I mean, there's so many there's so many projects right now that we're all very surprised about. I mean, you could say the same thing about SpaceX mm. and reusable rockets. It hasn't exactly been proven yet. So, right. um, yeah, at least for, at least in a business model case, technically sure, sure. it's feasible, but for business model case, that's what I'm talking about with SpaceX. So, yeah, that's 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 what, all my point there. Yeah, Jared, you look like you're brewing on a comment there. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, just like. Progress, especially in in exploration and things like that, it's not a parade of victories. Mm -hmm. There are a tremendous number of failures. The, the success is success is the rarity, mm -hmm. so it's the exception, not the expectation in things like Interesting. this. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so, uh, if you don't roll the dice, 
you're not you're not in the game, you know. It's yeah. like what Wayne Gretzky, you know, that really great Wayne Gretzky quote where yes. he's like, "You miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take." Yep. Um, so if you just want to stick around and not do anything, that's fine. You're good to do that. But there's a lot of people um, who are willing to put that on the line, and I don't have a problem seeing people put it on the line as long as they're doing it mostly competently. Right. Um, it's, it's a, yeah. it's it a takes good, a tiny <laughs> bit of crazy with a lot of bit of competency. It sure yeah. does. Um, yeah. and, and to really step up and do these things mm -hmm. that, you know, really were up till maybe about five years ago considered the realm of science fiction. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not, yeah. I mean, this, these are not things that people were talking about with seriousness five years ago. Right. Um, yeah. And now, you know, Series A funding more than we expected. Like, okay, yeah. now we're starting to get into the realm of of of, of reality as opposed to fiction. Um, so it's a uh, it's it's you know people are going to fail, and that's just the way it works. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, and if and if it takes. Uh, you know, you, I would hope that I would hope everybody. I wish everybody the best success mm -hmm. uh, for that and what they do. Um, but really, it's kind of up to whatever ends up happening, and that's definitely a risk worth taking. So, yeah. so I don't have a problem with you know something like that um, happening. I don't have a problem with other people failing as well because I know at some point someone's going to succeed. Right. Exactly. So. And that's what's so important I think is that because there are a lot of startups that's like what's actually pushing the game more. You know, that's constantly having the building blocks and that's building up to something really big. If no one was actually having the courage to do anything then we wouldn't get anywhere because we're all moving as one human species. That's a thing. And it's not necessarily that like, oh, why would I bother doing this when someone's already doing it great? Right. It's like, well, someone's doing it great. Maybe I can do it in a different way. Maybe I can do it better or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of everybody actually doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And I also just wanted to point out a few awesome comments yeah. in the chat. Like yeah. some of you guys are saying, I would definitely go. I wouldn't go. I like like Marty the Martian, 100% space geek, but I'm one of the few who doesn't want to go. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and I I think that that's so interesting to realize because there's people that maybe didn't consider themselves space geeks and they're like, I would go tomorrow. Right. I mean, like Katy Perry has a ticket to go to space, you know, and right, I think right. that that's like awesome. And she didn't know too much about space before, well, her interview with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's like yes. so cool and super important to realize because there's this constant diversity mm -hmm. and maybe there's people that are into space, but are like, honestly, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't go. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just, I think that's cool. And then, uh, Avidus Nerva said, uh, "Space hotels. We need chefs, concierge services, etc. Too. Heck and yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so you we'll need that on the ground. Janitors. Period. <laughs> yeah. For your team. Exactly. So, especially I mean, for the dirty humans in space. Yeah. We need some clean I mean, up. <laughs> like, you know, there's room. There really, truly is room for everybody. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's that's yeah. the way it is. So." Awesome. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, before we go, I want to make sure I give still give a thank you to our ground support citizens. These are the people who contribute $1 or more per episode, and every little bit helps. Of course, of course, of course, you definitely get your name in the show. You absolutely deserve at least that much. If you are interested in becoming a citizen of tomorrow, please feel free. Head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Uh, that's about all we have for this week. Next week, we have Kim Stedman, a JPL science systems engineer of the JPL Mars rover missions. Oh, that'll be amazing. Looking forward <laughs> to it. So cool. <laughs> that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, that's all we have for this week. So feel free to, uh, if you're watching live, hang out and uh, join us in After Dark. And if not, we will see you next week. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.